Nats FM is brought to you by Senadia, the stewards of the Nats project. Hey folks, welcome to episode 7. And we're going to talk about Nats and patterns and the kind of things that you can do with it beyond the basic styles of functionality. Before we get into that, a little bit of a recap on the last episode where we talked about 210 and we've kind of, I guess, feel like I've been waiting forever for 210 to come out and Byron hosted that. So Byron, have you recovered from the last time? <laughs> Uh, yes, yes, I have. Um, almost. Yeah, there's still still some things to do. You know, you, you get you get a release out there and then people ask questions and you identify all the gaps in the docs and that still remain. But it's been it's been generally positive so far. Um, people are excited and we keep just cranking away, taking feedback, fixing, you know, subsequent issues post release. It's been a long time coming, as everyone knows. So it's good, but generally everyone's been very positive. So fixing issues? You mean there's been there's been issues? Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, we don't no. write perfect software, so oh. that's, that's fine. Well, at least we're <laughs> honest, right? I mean, it could be worse. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Yeah, two ten though. I mean, oh wow, we've been waiting for it for so long. How long was it? Do you know what the duration was between two nine to two ten? Literally just over a year. So a year and a wow. few days, a year and a week, roughly. Um, yeah. So it's been a long time coming, but. Go back if you missed that episode. Go back and listen to the whole journey that we uh, we went over. It's it's entertaining, and um, you'll yeah you'll get some insight into actually like all of the new things, new methods, new techniques that we've been applying to just make Nats more robust um, between two nine and two ten. So definitely definitely re listen, re rewatch if you if you missed that one. Absolutely, yeah. So two ten, new era. Speaking of new eras, um, I think we're getting to a point where we talk about the basics so much. We talk about PubSub and expect that everybody knows what PubSub is, and we talk about request reply, and we go, well, everybody should know this stuff. And then we talk about, hey, we've got these, you know, KV thing, and we've got these object store things. And yeah, what did you know? You can do streaming, and you know, that's quite vanilla. And then it takes deeper conversations to find homes for those stars of technologies. And even then, somebody will go, oh, I didn't know you could do that with Nats using this same pattern that we've had forever. Oh, the same set of capabilities, sorry, that we've we've had forever. And I think this is what this this whole episode is about. So episode seven, I think I initially um, labeled it going off piste, which was maybe a bit of a stupid title. And really episode seven, it's more just Nats and patterns and the things we can do that maybe we don't have to, you know, over-engineer or think about. So... Out of interest, like what was the first thing you did with Nats? Silly question, maybe. Good, good question. It's been a long time. Um, well, I use Nats prior to Nat streaming and prior to Jetstream, so it was all straight up messaging request reply. So I had a a, a need in my organization at the time, my projects to um, have more sort of asynchronous uh, message delivery. So the pub sub, fan out, fan in, I use that because I needed to notify a bunch of things. I didn't want to use uh, some other weird hacks over HTTP to accomplish that. So that, that was literally one of the first things I had done. And then when the streaming, I, I, start, I did start with Nat streaming originally uh, before Jetstream came to fruition. And I use that heavily for a lot of ETL-based ex extract, transform, and load type of data pipelines. So before data engineering was actually a term or a role or a discipline, um, ETL was the thing, and that existed for a couple decades. Um, but yeah, I, we would write kind of custom data pipelines to move data around between systems. And I use Nat streaming in at that time for um, taking data out, transforming it, throwing it into a stream. And then I was able to fan out effectively, consume from that stream and plop it in other systems. The official term being plop. I like that. Plop. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so using all the best words. So yeah, it, it, it was, it was fairly vanilla things. I didn't do anything, um, super, super complex at the time. I just used the basic primitives that were there. But then again, Nat Streaming had had a handful of knobs for the streams that you could do, but fairly limited. It was mostly around 
like limits. So you could say max messages and things like that. But um, I think I, I want to hear your experience too, by the way. But um, but I think what what's very interesting with with Jetstream and Nats today and the abstractions we now have, like KV and Object Store, we have a bunch of different configuration options that I think on first glance can overwhelm people. And that's one thing that we are aware of. And there's reasons for those those knobs to be there. But I think coming into it fresh, you people always have the question like, why would I use this? When would I use this? And I think that's one of the things we're going to uh, not just this episode, we'll have plenty more patterns episodes over time, but sort of starting to debunk and, and connect the dots between like, what is this, you know, what does this config option do? And then why do should I care about it? When would I apply it? That kind of thing. What patterns can I uh, derive from these knobs effectively? Yeah. So. Yeah. And this is, I think that the question obviously was always loaded. Um, we always start off from a pattern based approach when we're exploring these things and then somehow we get to the well here are the core features and then you should be able to figure this stuff out on your own but sometimes it needs a, a story or a use case to be able to really make use of them certainly my first use case oh 2015 you know had no responsibilities no gray hair i had a really nice car you know v8 supercharged jaguar god I them of the days um and what I needed to do, I was I was writing a plugin for an automation platform called Stackstorm. So I was a technical marketing engineer and also a contributor to the to the platform. Um, and what I was building was a very inception-y uh, syslog ingestion system. And the idea was that on on Stackstorm, you would create a regular expression in like a, just a field, and then um, it would be from switches and routers and firewalls. But what I wanted to do was push those um, push those uh, logs and i'd build events you know see if one log happened from over here and then i'd, I'd build like a a dag and complete the dag once the dag was completed it would generate an event and then that would trigger automation so on an internet exchange it might be go and shut a port down or go and change a mac address on you know on a peering link or something um but what happened was i didn't know where to solve the problem so it was either i wrote a load of horrendous code that lived in a plugin and the plugin was very circular so what would happen was the circ uh, that the plugin would read configuration from the from the, um, the configuration database of this of the system, and then anything that matched went through the pipeline back to the automation platform, which meant the work that the basically the CPU load was always very very you know very low. But what I didn't know what to do or how to do was with multiple instances of these systems how to enable east to west communication and then teleport those logs into the processing pipeline. So my first instance with Nats really was around how to connect together all of these separate processing instances and then have them go through one head end system because I, the last thing I want is 10 systems basically doing a denial of service attack onto a core internet infrastructure um, and how to do that reliably. So in case one machine died, another one would take over. And then it went from there then to using for things like um, service reconciliation. So what would happen is it'd be lots of, not really microservices, just lots of different systems, but they all needed to wait for like a global signal, like a flare gun event, you know, everything, these things have been done. Now everybody go and do your thing in one time window. So I started using it for, for that. And then I was like, well, what if one of the systems misses a signal? And then it's like, well, Stan can solve that. <laughs> Um, and then I started to think about streaming. So I came at this from a very different angle than I think most people do today. There wasn't any notion of, oh, I can do this with Kafka. It was like, I'm looking for synchronization of, of basically events over different time space systems. And I mean that genuinely. So even instances where you're winning virtual machines and you're doing time sliced CPU operations and you get clock drift and things, you can't reliably do these, you know, things. You can't rely on real time clocks and stuff, even with, you know, um, Oh, hell, tell me. Um, clock synchronization. Um, Time of clocks. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, the words are not coming. It's a Friday and brain's pretty much fried. Um, yeah, even with it kind of clock syncs, um, it's still not good enough sometimes. I actually NTP. want... NTP. Yes, there we go. Yeah, NTP, there we go. no time protocol. <laughs> Sorry, thank you for being my savior today. <laughs> I always do something dumb on every episode. My brain seems to like do just empty the cash. I'm like, cash miss? Crap. <laughs> just... 
that's, that's for help. There you go, boys and girls. That's for help the next time you're stuck and you know derping around looking for a word. But there we go. Yeah, so NTP would fail me sometimes. Um, the system wouldn't catch up enough. And actually, it really is important <clears throat> when, when events needed to be synchronized. So yeah, I came at it really weirdly. But I kind of fell in love with it at the same time. Somebody said, oh, have you looked at NATS? I'm like, no. And then it was like within an hour, I got a proof of, pro a proof of concept working. I'm like, oh, damn, mm -hmm. all this other code can now go in the, in the trash. I'm, I'm like, wow, this is so simple. And then, yeah, would you believe yeah. eight years later, here I am doing it for a living, which is just amazing. So patterns. Uh, and we're also lucky that somebody from the community came forward and said, hey, what kind of things can you do with Nats over and above, which is great. So thank you to that person. We'll put in, put their, maybe their name with permissions in the show notes. Um, but mm -hmm. what we've done is we've gathered then some buckets of patterns and we tried to pin them to an abstraction of a technology. So do you want to kick off with the first bucket? Ironically. Yeah, yeah. We can uh, get into KV patterns. So I think... I think with, um, again, when, when learning about KVs and streams, we had a, a couple episodes back, we had Tamash on the show and importantly, he covered the fact that KV and object store are client abstractions that lay on top of the stream. And these abstractions are very convenient to use because the amount of knobs that they have are, are smaller in scope and people know generally what a KV, like a hash map, KV bucket type of thing is, you know, you can put values, you can get values, put or set depending on your terminology, but you can, um, and then there's like kind of other bits such as create and update, which are, um, and for, for those who don't know, KV buckets support optimistic con concurrency control. You can have a sequence number and that kind of stuff. So we'll get into that and why that matters in a second, but so you have basically a handful of methods that you can use on a KV bucket. People understand that. And then the question is, well, what, what can you actually do with that? Um, and I think another unique uh, feature of our KV buckets and other systems have this as well, but is the, is the watcher. Um, it's inherently a stream under the hood. So why can't you, you know, just like a consumer, you can watch changes over time. And so you can have this KV bucket, you, you do puts and write operations, deletes, updates, things like that. And then you just kind of keep getting these updates in a stream over time. You can subscribe to them, which is pretty cool. So that's like a super high level overview, I think of the KV bucket. Um, so with that optimistic concurrency control, and this notion of if you have two competing, let's say clients, two competing things that are trying to access the same key or update the same key, let's say, you have the ability, the server has the ability to basically prevent both concurrent writes to happen at the same time, for example. So what, what does that look like in you know, your typical programming model David, <laughs> what, <laughs> what does that look like? There's this shared resource and uh -huh. you need to prevent concurrent. You're going to make rights. me use a word, aren't you? You're going to make me say mutual exclusion. Ah, uh, yes. 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 So I, I love this. It's like, I've got a concurrency problem. What do you do? Slap a mutex on or to use your word, everyone just plop a mutex right on there and gate the thing off, which is fine when you're working in a, you know, a single system, a single binary, but when we move across to a distributed system, mm. how then we share, you know, protect one resource across two things, never mind three, four, five, whatever. And you could always argue if you're protecting one resource from more than maybe a couple of, of, of worker systems, maybe you want to readdress your design ever so slightly, just saying. Um, but yeah, I think this is this is a really nice first touch point of KV. So in if we move then from like a single binary approach to say just two systems just to keep it simple um right we have i don't know let's think uh we want to update a customer record and we've done almost a shotgun i don't know why we do this but hell we've just published the the updated system um from maybe from a ui and we've got now a backend that needs to go to the record of uh sorry the system of record uh ie database whatever and make a write and we don't want to do two writes because let's say i know we're paying usage based rights, but we can abuse NATS and we can use NATS to, you know, handle the contention of that resource. 
maybe that's a terrible use case and you can probably think of a much better one. Maybe it's a door entry system, I don't know, you know, or like um, turnstile systems. We don't want two people passing through when there's only one token that's been purchased. Any other examples you can think of for, for a distributed mutex like this? I mean, I mean, there are loads, but obviously we're hot footing it right now on a podcast. Yeah, hot, hot footing for <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, yeah, I think it's, it's uh, I mean, there's, there's evolutions of that. So we can get into even like this leasing concept as well, um, which is kind of combines the time element. You know, there's, there's, you're, you're taking a lock on something and then you're expecting eventually to give that lock back. And there might be this inversion where it's like somebody takes the lock and then that lock is going to time out. And then everybody competing for that lock again is just going to have to like run and, you know, try to acquire it again. So that, that, that that's an interesting one. So like, yeah, I think people can grok the single mutex example leases kind of bring in this time element and combining KV, you can set a TTL on keys, for example, that's, that's opt-in and you can say, Hey, this key, um, will eventually expire, you know, after, um, certain number of seconds, minutes, what have you, whatever the use case is. And then, so you can have all of these kind of competing, uh, components saying, Hey, can I get a lease? Nope. The key's still there. Hey, can I get a lease? Nope. The key's still there. And eventually it's going to expire. And then somebody's going to acquire that lease after that point. So we're trying to like build up this yeah, mental model of, you know, some, somebody has ownership for that given time, whether they hand it back or not is one, one bit, but you could also say as the server, as the thing that is actually like setting that TTL, it, it basically dictates like for all of these competing components to say, you only can acquire this for a certain amount of time. And then everybody else has a chance again to be able to acquire it. So, yeah, I think you just set up the whole episode for this one item. And obviously <laughs> I called this particular, you know, group of things, a bucket, ironically being KV. Hence uh, the word ironically, just in case you didn't catch that. Um, <clears throat> I'm terrible at jokes, pure dad joke all the way. So let's talk about, I guess, the, the, the first easiest way of doing this where maybe a key is called i don't know processing and processing means something to a to a bunch of services and then there's a race all the machines try and write the key and the one that writes it and maybe there's a there's a sub key within the value of id of the node that's done the right and then maybe um after they all try and, and do a write they all go and do a read and go oh well, i'm not the one that won so i'm going to stand down and i think this is a thing that people forget with mutex is as well that um it's down to the developer to adhere to the lock nothing's going to actually lock the data out i mean you can take revoke permissions from a service but that's kind of stupid it's down to the you know the um i guess proper coding approach or proper programming a programming approach to ensure that you're following the rules that you've set so nats isn't some kind of magic firewall it's literally just going to help you make decisions on what can write and what can't write so in terms of that basic one so it, all we're doing here now there's just a race something writes with a with an id then they all kind of go well i've tried to write who won and then everybody else stands down on weights and then maybe we could put a ttl on that or maybe they have to release it but i think the ttl ones are interesting uh, and maybe um the one that won now has a, a revision of the last the last write so we can go back and even update it maybe and increase the increment the ttl um or certainly um you know a write time just in case it's a long-lived job but then there's the other argument of, do you have like, um, what's the word? Not a historian, but like a watcher, like a, th th there's a legal term for it. I can't remember. It's not a secretary. It's like, um, not an accountant. It's like a bureau style thing. Tell me again, I'm struggling today. Archivist. Uh, I'm not sure. Yeah. That's a fact, like a historian or a, like an archivist. Yeah. Yeah. So the idea is that they're watching everybody that's tried to have a running start at this and then they've got the bunch of IDs. And then as soon as the heartbeat disappears, maybe from the one doing the work, they go back and actually delete the key and then maybe issue another signal saying restart job or something. So you could make this a simple little and wow, we really can't talk today. Simpler, sim simple, uh, or as hard as, as you want. I mean, so that's probably one look at um just a, a basic mutex where it's kind of like a be run and grab um and then yeah the well-behaved workers step back and then you know let, let the winner do do the thing anything you want to destroy argue or uh, or adjust on that or add to no 
no, I, I think, I think that's good. Um, and, and again, it's, it's obviously challenging. Ho hopefully the mental model is building up for people, but it's always, you know, show me the code or show me a diagram or something. So fortunately we're going to be getting there at, at some point. So, uh, in, in, in the future. So I'm just going to leave that little hint, um, <laughs> for, for maybe some, some new resource coming in the future. So that's, that's fun. But I figured conversationally, it's useful to talk about these patterns and give examples of real world type types of things. So I know tying it sort of maybe the next evolution, bring in another example. You've been in the gaming space in the past for a long time. And what, what kind of use case would necessitate something shared, a shared lock, maybe a TTL is in the mix. Maybe you have more, more generalized from a mutex as a semaphore where you can have maybe a pool of resources that everyone is trying to compete for. And maybe there's like five things, 10 things, whatever. And they can all, you know, acquire a lock or one of those resources at a given time. And you might have them releasing at any given time as well. So it opens, it basically, you have a, you have a pool of things that pool is depleted and then incrementally that pool is filled, filled back up, yeah. taken out back, back and forth kind of thing. So I'm sure, I'm sure games, online games use a lot of these, <laughs> a lot of these patterns. If I told you I'd have to kill you, but you're too far away. So maybe I'll just <laughs> break my neck and share stuff. Um, the interesting thing is when I was in the gaming space, uh, a lot of these technologies were somebody's dream. It was 15 years ago now, I think quite a while ago, maybe 16 years ago. Um, but some of the problems we faced then would be largely solved by using that today. So some of the things would be like, um, you're playing a racing game and you're collecting data, telemetry data from a game. Um, I'm not gonna go into all the boring networking stuff, but we would basically steer a TCP connection over UDP to say an Xbox, pull information from uh, you know from a racetrack and then we'd be able to recreate a ghost lap so if you played any kind of recent f1 game rally game whatever you'd have ghost laps of your friends that also play the game well they're not videos i mean it's that they're recreated in the game from telemetry so you'd have velocity you know coordinates directions all this other stuff you know uh, and then the the car is kind of re-rendered in the in the game loop that you're in but replayed with a dare i say real-time map um of a, of a recorded lap from somewhere else. But people always wanted to see their best lap. And it's not a recording from the game, it's a bunch of telemetry information. So one of the services where uh, things like semaphores and stuff are useful is you'd only have limited resources to generate those videos. You might have a server farm. So you've got like a thousand people playing the game and there would be a queue to go and get those um, to get those renders. And that's, and you, I can hear almost now the C, you know, the C++ developers screaming who built these things. Yeah, yeah, but the game console can do all this stuff. Yeah, but it's not going to upload it to YouTube. So what would happen is the services in the data center would recreate the track, recreate the car, recreate the lap, and then it would render a video and then it would link it to your social profile and put it onto YouTube for you. And we could only do so many things at a time with that. So that's one example. Uh, and then um, other one would be accessing things like storage sands, you know, for um, you wanted to, I don't know, write your magic armor or something. There'd, there'd only be so many write cycles for some of these things. We'd have to queue some of them up or just to hold the game client back before they could write. Now, a lot of the, the game systems and game servers embedded these uh, locks and stuff in the code. We had very little control over them, really, from an external point of view. Um, but they also caused no end of problems because it was like this ships in the night welding of the game server to the infrastructure. And we had to make sure IOPS and everything were there. So we had an abundance of connectivity and abundance of IOPS to make sure when we slotted the game wards in, and it's not like it's one game ward, it was like several hundred servers to build, you know, one crappy game ward, you could go around and kill an orc. Um, it was that kind of style of stuff. And you just had to hope and pray that it worked. But if we could expose a lot of that stuff, or if we could have done back then through something like Nats, we'd have actually in-game control where we could tie it up to the infrastructure, like hand in glove, and that would have been been amazing. So I think the, the ghost lap one, bit of a stretch maybe, but I kind of like that one because it, it really shows what we were trying to do. Um, but accessing uh, IO bound um, systems, like when you're trying to write to a, a SAN that's only got a limited amount of throughput, for instance, that was always a good one. Or even uploading actually. So uh, thinking about this, uploading patches and updates to CDNs, you could only upload a certain amount of files or at a certain rate or so many connections. 
and across a distributed system, that's kind of difficult. So even using NATs to gate some of this stuff off would have been really, really useful. So yeah, loads and loads of, I guess, of game to infra style use cases for that. Never mind just the gaming or just the infra. I like the use cases, by the way, that spam both. I think there's some real value there and it ties the, the actual code and the systems together to the operational aspect. I think Nats would have been a massively powerful there. But I know you have history, huge amounts of history in medical land, something that I've never done other than just reading off sensors. So um, I'm going to spin this one back to you for these kind of use cases. Anything in the medical space that you can talk about without getting yourself lynched? Trying to trying to think. I mean, it, again, I, I I worked on I worked on the research side largely, um, not in the critical path of you know clinician, doctor software uh, kinds of things, but on the on the data side, trying to you know pull data out of systems. There's always going to be there's obviously a lot of SQL, a lot of relational data. Naturally, there's a lot of I'm not going to get get down that rabbit hole of um, other data systems that hospitals use, because uh, interestingly, there's there's very old uh, data systems that are just like a giant single namespace key value uh, thing that is actually backing many medical record systems and people aren't even aware of. So just about, you know, where where would these be? <laughs> <I'm joking>. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's that, that's that's a whole other fun fun topic. Um, so yeah, for, for KV patterns in particular, I, I didn't use, cause again, like when, when I was applying and doing ETL pipelines and things like that, I mean, I, you could, you could use them again. I didn't at the time cause it wasn't even available when I was working in that space, but often what we had to do and what's, what's interesting with, um, and, and even before like, you know, CDC for change data capture type of systems that really got mature, like Debezium and things like that, like those didn't exist at the time that I worked in this. But one challenge that we had always faced with data pipelines in general is keeping track of the last like offset, the last, you know, record in the database, for example, that we actually processed or we read. And that gets really tricky in just the fact that, you know, this is, Relational t tables are update in place. How do you know that you know you you retry a, a thing and that record actually didn't uh, change in the meantime? But for certain tables, especially in in the medical space, they're append only inherently. They have to be for regulatory reasons, but also inherently because you come into the doctor, you have a visit of some kind, you have vital sign checks, you have some some data is time series, some data is like. I have an audit log of like all the things that happened during a visit. You can't go back and change that. I mean, there's like edge cases of, of the need to do that if there's missing data and things like that, but most of the data is immutable. And that's when you could rely on the fact that if you're building data pipelines and you're, you're doing more batch processing, processing type of type of things, which was very common, still is very common. You need to keep track of the last offset. And what, what gets interesting is that you're saying, okay, well, how do you do that at a certain level of scale where you, you know, process this whole batch, but you want to be able to paralyze maybe some of the batch processing, because a lot of the data, if you're, if you're doing research analytics of some kind, you're actually, you know, taking in data across patients. It's not just a single patient. So as long as you keep, you know, the relative order of events that occur to a patient, um, that's your unit of parallelism effects effectively or concurrency in this case. So you could say, I want to select out a batch of given, given this patient, I, or I want to process the, the patient records. Um, you could maintain a key, the last offset. And if you had multiple workers going back, you kind of alluded to this before you have multiple workers that are all trying to process concurrently. You just have a pool of workers, just grab a job, grab the last offset, relative to this table or what what have you that you're processing, that's where you can deal with this competing consumer problem. And you get sort of that lock. And then the expectation is you can even set, you can even have like two keys and you can say, okay, I acquired this lock. This is my current state. So it doesn't have to be a binary true false, you know, mutex. 
you can have a you can have a state machine almost in, in a way because you can control what that that value is and so as long as this this thing is basically saying here's my next state i'm i'm you know i'm in progress i'm doing my thing and then maybe you just have logic in your code that says i expect this to roughly finish after this amount of time and if that state has not updated after this amount of time then i'm going to assume that job failed because mm -hmm. maybe something just happened a witness by the way that's what i was looking for before you start witness. the witness going go hey come back there in is. five minutes and, and then it would like literally be okay. like a ledger you'd have like a legal thing where it go yep I'm the I'm the legal dude, dude yeah. whatever. I'm gonna come back and sort you out if you don't, you know. Yeah, behave. that's that's a per perfect. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. Archivist, yeah, it didn't didn't work. The witness is perfect. Yeah, so the witness is like this out of thing, like observing what's going on has you know its own notion of the the expected times, um, and it can it can basically say, hey, this took a lot longer than I expected. And, and sometimes, you know, processing can take a very long time, depending. So you have to you have to get a sense of, of what that takes, but you can still rely on this like, you know, state transition, the single key um, acting as a lock, but you also have some metadata, some state information. And then this witness can come in and say, mm, I'm going to I'm going to assume that this failed for whatever reason, or it's not transitioning, uh, reset the state and another worker can pick it up and retry again. And that gets into a whole other, you know, you have to design, there's many downstream things like item potency, you have to be aware of that, but given you have in these types, in this particular scenario, you have like either natural keys or primary keys that you can actually rely on across systems. Um, you can use, you can rely on those types of things to model sort of an item potent downstream processing, but all this little state tracking stuff, People don't think of like how important that is. And it's like, where do you put that? How do you have this shared resource that is also distributed and other things can access it rather than having a local file where like nothing else can see it or needing to use a SAN or something. Um, so that would be, if I were to do that today, that's where I would have put that state. Otherwise I had basically a database, which which works, but it's you, you don't have that benefit of really watching, you know, the state changes over time. So that's the other key thing here is like, as these jobs are running, as the state is updating, you can actually watch that in real time as they change. And you can also have this like external witness thing that can kind of like intervene if, if necessary. So, you know, we said earlier on that there might be more of these uh, episode style patterns. I think this one could actually span at least two. So you've got me really thinking now about like processing DAGs in mm -hmm. asynchronous time space. Where so if you had like I don't know the top of a job would be you know go look at some I don't know some network events and the problem is each network event might be go do a HTTP call you know pass the page get some information back and if that fails after I don't know if the if the word changes and then changes back for instance so you get like a rising edge and a falling edge change within three minutes then issue a change you think oh okay that's that's kind of interesting but the problem is you've got your independent probe going off to go and get the data. And then if the data changes, you've got something watching the key to say, ah, oh, have you changed? And then that's going to hold its own state to try and yield the eventual outcome. And then that's going to update like a, a master key or, you know, something higher up the stack to say, ah, I've now gone into a failed state. So you've got two or three states below the main state. But the nice thing with the keys and the watches I love is you can have independent blobs of data being watched, separate keys being watched. You can have buckets being watched, you know, whatever. But it means that you can create these if you draw them, you know, draw them, it's like a one coherent DAG, but in real time and space, no, it's computed is they can all be running separately. And I, I love that. That's that, I love the fact that you can do that with KV. Yeah. And, Break and, these things apart, you know? And to your point, you can model because of the, because keys are under the hood, just subjects and you have a token hierarchy, hmm. you can, like you said, you can, you know, model a DAG as a, as a hierarchy naturally. And then you can watch a subtree, right? Right. And then you gain <laughs> you some superpowers. Well, yeah. the little thing you gain is you could have like a, a witness look at the, the first part of the token. And then any change that happens to the keys, you've now got a while log being written at the same time. And you get that for free. It's like, what the hell? It, it just, it's magic. I mean, I, I love it. The more I think about this kind of stuff, you know, the, the more beautiful it is. Um, I know we also said 
we'll keep this episode short. And that's also kind of failing. But um, moving on from, from this, I think that there's some more complex things as well. So beyond the realms of, you know, kind of data processing, we've also got things like how do we distribute policy across a system or across a fleet? So, you know, doing things like storing source of truth, maybe for firewall rules for a bunch of Linux in instances. So instead of like, you know, Ansible and Terraform and Puppet and Chef and all these other things going off and configuring them, what if each system realized its own state, right? So there's a local agent running, you watch the KV store, um, and then it programmed its own IP table stuff. And you could do that. You could write scripts to do it. You could run your favorite IAC tool of choice on there. But what it, what it ultimately means is you don't have a centralized orchestration pool of stuff dealing with fleet management. What you might do is break apart the, the, the relative declarative high-level state that you want these systems to be in and then have the systems realize that themselves. I think that's kind of cool. So we've got this like distributed policy thing and firewall policy. That's kind of useful. So you think, well, okay, most people will get to that point, hopefully at this point in the podcast, going, oh, I could do some of this stuff, but we can take it one step further. So what if um, we now have a policy of things that can hit these machines and we don't have a you know, TCP load balancer because that's stupid, we're not going to do that. We're not going to introduce these massive chunks of machinery that you no longer need. NATS can deal with some of the load balancing stuff like we've covered on previous episodes. But we might have a usage-based system that we've created for downstream customers. And then we've got these things, you know, leaky token buckets. So these token buckets, they deplete when you use a service and they refill over time. There's normally a formula and some, some inputs to that. Um, I love the idea of using NATS for distributed leaky token processing in a farm that's kind of awesome so any thoughts around this one i would like to hear more about have you used leaky tokens in the in the past heavy networking yeah okay yeah yeah so in quality of service things like that leaky tokens are or leaky token buckets are really quite a thing so what they allow you to do is they allow you to burst so for instance if you have like a commit I don't know, one megabits a second, you can burst over that commit for short periods of time, providing that you have breathing space for it to recover on the other side, of, on the other on the, on the downslope. What it means is you don't give yourself denial of service problems and you have breathing space. So sometimes your ISPs do this with you. They'll put you on like a traffic shape or a police. Or a police is like a hard stop. It kind of like, it kind of cuts the top of your, you know, your bandwidth off. But a shaper, um, the way the shapers work, you can burst over and you can recover um, as soon as tokens mount up. But you end up with this this notion of like this kind of time-based share of a, of a service. And that's fine when you've got one bucket, say on a, a line card, an ASIC, an interface, or one system. But the second that you want to split that bucket up between a pool of workers, that's not easy. And I think in this distributed world we find ourselves in, Nats can provide a solution for that. Would that... Would that be roughly akin to rate limiting in a way, but yeah, sort of, yeah. Okay. More forgiving. So More rate forgiving. limiting to a point. Yeah, without... you're not blocked, but yeah. it can, you could, you start the timer and it's like, let's trail off a little bit. You're going over your limit yeah. kind of thing. It's a fairness algorithm. It's like a queuing fairness. theory thing. Yeah. So it's yeah. all around fairness and these, these buckets allow you to, you know, run a service burst when you need to, but then you mm. kind of get slowed down and recover. And, and it, it, it's great for, you know, theoretical, you know, load balancing multiple services and doing some basic oversubscription and things. But um, yeah, doing that in a distributed way though is, is not easy because you end up with your current amount of tokens remaining systems that then want to consume some and then other systems that have to hold back knowing they can't actually get a batch. So there's no point going, and this is another, I think we find in distributed systems, there's no point going to a token book going, give me one token, give me one token, give me one token, because the overhead of getting that token and mess it, messing around, you put more load on the system than you do the actual thing that you built. So it's kind of like, give me 100 tokens. And the problem is you might starve one system out, but that's the problem with, you know, uh, fair kind of fair systems, you know, theoretical systems that deal in fairness you know to be fair sometimes you have to be unfair something has to suffer so something else can have a fair treatment yeah that makes sense yeah and then one that i know that you're dying to talk about kubernetes leases oh yeah oh yeah so so this is this is a fun one but it might resonate with with folks who know kubernetes um so so nats has been um for those who know about K3S, which is sort of the uh, distribution of Kubernetes that is designed for edge 
deployments typically, like smaller, smaller resource deployments. There is a project called Kine, which is a library, K-I-N-E, that, which means uh, Kine is not etcd. <laughs> and the intention behind that was actually to swap out the etcd layer of a standard Kubernetes deployment. And the motivation was that if in these sort of edge environments, if you wanted to use, let's say, an embedded SQLite database, you might deploy a Kubernetes environment as a single node, you know, single worker, depending on the edge location. You might want other relational databases. That's sort of how it started, SQLite embedded, and then other relational databases that you could plug into. And a contributor actually year and a half ago or so, contributed NATS as a backend. So once KV landed in NATS, the abstraction landed um, in a release, somebody contributed NATS as a alternate backend within the Kine abstraction layer. But what that means is that you can basically use Kubernetes K3S in this case with NATS as this storage backend instead of etcd or SQLite or things like that. and. Etcd is a KV store. It has a, a watcher um, type of functionality as well. And so the idea was that, hey, Nats KV can do these things. And so the initial implementation happened, and there's a blog post on the Nats blog for people curious. Um, but yeah, so that, so that landed in there. And what's interesting uh, with that original implementation, it was really designed for a single node deployment and so a lot of work has gone into making it sort of just like etcd the ability to create an actual ha version of, of k3s so three nodes is your typical ha because it uses raf consensus um, in this in this case and in working on this so i i contributed some of this um, in working on this you would observe the fact that you would have these like three servers these three you know k3s servers at a minimum all trying to acquire a lease on the KV bucket. And it was fascinating to kind of see that, that behavior. And th this is literally exactly what it's using internally. And this is how it uses etcd as well, but it's just saying, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm the you know, current leader, let's say, of the, of the node. So it's almost doing quorum-based things. So even though, even though you know, uh, Nats KV, Nat streams, etcd included, they, they have their own RAF consensus that, that is sort of identifying the leader of, let's say, the KV bucket. The nodes themselves in Kubernetes have to also agree to who is a leader, who's, you know, all, all the API server traffic is going through, let's say, in this case. So because it already has, you know, this quorum-based, this consensus-based thing baked in, you can leverage KV as a way to model that for a higher level um, kind of use case. So in this case, these are three K3S nodes that are all trying to say, who's the leader in this case? And then other things happen as a result of that. But all of them are always trying to acquire a lease to say, am I the leader? Am I not the leader? You know, you timed out, so I'm gonna try to acquire the next lease, that type of thing. So that was interesting to observe that behavior of saying, okay, there's sort of, quorum and consensus at the state, you know, state management, like who's the leader of the KV bucket. But then there's also the higher level thing of Kubernetes trying to identify in its own, you know, layer, um, who's, who's the leader of, among the, the, uh, nodes. So that, that was a very interesting sort of thing that I knew was possible, but seeing it in the real world was very cool to see. Um, and so for any, more generally for people thinking of saying, I need to build, you know, a distributed system, but I need, you know, a leader, I need a leader election, I need quorum, I need, you know, leasing and unleasing. You can use Nats KV to do that in this case, if you're, if you've already adopted Nats. So that was a cool, cool side benefit of working on that project to, to see that. Yeah. And it's, it's not exactly a light one, is it? I mean, you know, underlying <laughs> Kubernetes is, um, Underpinning Kubernetes, sorry, is, is, is no is no light feat as in the responsibility is high, reliability is a must. And putting Nats there when people say, you know, can we do things that are reliable? Well, yes, I think is the the answer. But uh, yeah, uh, we've got some we've got some amazing 
things we can do even with just you take the basic kv and people go well great i can use it as a cache but there's so many other areas that you can apply this thing to so there we go episode seven just on kv and we've got some we've got some more patterns that we'll come back to with using different parts of nats but yeah thanks baron like i say it's good to good to be back in the realms of let's go fiddle with things as well i mean i know the 210 episode was great but it felt really serious because of the magnitude of, of the work involved um, it's a great episode. I mean, even for me to listen to and, you know, just kind of be on the outside of it was um, so much goes into this stuff. So, yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's good stuff. Cool. Looking forward to, looking forward to more of these episodes, too. <laughs> yeah. And what we'll do over time, I think, as well, um, you hinted at something that may or may not be coming, um, but will hopefully be in a position to um, tease out some uh, some examples at some point. But there we go. We'll say no more on that one future episode <laughs> for future episodes yeah hint hint folks keep listening and on that note i'll um i'll stand back byron i uh, i did the intro let's in it all in fairness and and all that nonsense how do you want to uh round this one off any last thoughts uh, i don't think so i think like 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 always i mean we're really thankful for the person who um said hey how about you do some pattern episodes so it's like brilliant brilliant idea if you uh, enjoyed this format, if you wanted maybe some more concrete, you know, examples, give us all the feedback. We're, we'll listen. We'll adapt. Um, if if either of us were too rambly on some of these patterns, if you're like, just tell me how to do this thing, that's that's great feedback because we want this to actually be useful um, and inspire some ideas, things like that. So, yeah, if you're if you're uh, listen, give us feedback, positive, negative, how we can improve. And um, we'll certainly have more episodes in the future with uh, streams, object store, some hybrid approaches. So those are so those are interesting. How do you compose these pieces? Um, yeah. So any any last words, David? Yeah. Uh, if anybody wants more and they want code examples, uh, mm. you can go to buymeacoffee.com forward slash. I'm only joking. <laughs> <laughs> Or am I? No, I've got nothing to say, really. Um, I'm just amazed at some of the the functionality that Nats brings, what the community does with it as well, and the things that we find out about every day. And then I look back at history and just think, oh, damn, if only we could do, you know, have done this then. And it's, I'm kind of like full of regret that I can do nothing about, really, is my, my thing. But it's a Friday, yeah, so I think we're all beat up and ready for the weekend at this point. For sure. Yeah. Awesome stuff. Well, folks, um, if you liked like this, leave us a comment. Like we said before, hit the like button if you're on YouTube or star your favorite podcaster, and we will talk to you next time. Thanks so much. Do we usually say Nats IO? I think in the past we've done a mix between Nats and the Nats IO project, yeah. The, the previous intro quote says just Nats project. Okay. Yeah. Ah, it's good. That was that was a nice clean take. No pauses either. You've been practicing. You've been like running I, down the road. I, I really, I really have. <laughs> <laughs> Embarrassingly, I love it. Like, <laughs> podcast today. I have to say this. <laughs>